So I want to welcome everyone to the first of two Dan and Carol Burak President's Lectures this year. Thank you very much. As many of you know, UVM has con consolidated its four major lecture series, and that is the Aiken Lecture, the Zelserman Lecture, the Burak Lectures, and the Janus Forum. And this is under the banner of the Presidential Lecture Series. And each year, a committee of deans and vice provosts chooses a theme and structures all the lectures that year around that theme. The theme for this academic year is the question of free speech, a very timely topic. <laughs> each lecture in the series is made possible by endowments from generous donors. And today's lecture is possible because of the generosity and commitment to inquiry that has been provided by both Dan and Carol Burak. So thank you so much. <laughs> It's also appropriate that we bring one of our own to talk about free speech, a constitutional law expert, and our beloved President Emeritus of the University of Vermont, E. Thomas Sullivan. If any of you have seen his uh, CV, it is a fascinating one, and his career trajectory and what he has accomplished is quite amazing. Of course, he was our wonderful president from 2012 to 2019, and preceded by terms as provost at the University of Minnesota and the University of Arizona, and dean of the law colleges at the University of Minnesota, that's what I meant, and University of Arizona, president of the American Bar Association, a trial attorney in private practice, and a federal prosecutor for the United States Department of Justice. And he's published 13 books, and I will say five of them were during his presidency. So he never stopped being um, a scholar, even while he was leading us during those seven years. So thank you for that, Tom. He's also been a primary author of several publications, essays and commentaries, as well as teaching large classes. And when I've seen him on campus, I said, Tom, how's it going? He said, I love my classes. I said, how big are they? They're pretty big, Patty. Um, they're big classes, but I'm really uh, engaged with the students, and I'm loving it. And he's teaching classes in antitrust, government re regulation of business, civil procedure, complex litigation, trial practice, conflict of laws, um, pre-trial practice and procedure, constitutional law, and constitutional history. He has done so much um, in this area. Most relevant to his talk today is his co-authorship of the book, Free Speech, From Core Values to Current Debates. Tonight, he will push us to think and rethink our perspectives as he discusses the evolution of the free speech doctrine in the Supreme Court and its relevance to today's more divisive issues, including hate speech, internet expression, and campus speech. We are most fortunate to have a scholar of Tom's caliber on our campus, teaching our students and contributing mm to our knowledge as he is a leading voice in the complexities of free speech and its impact on our society. So please join me in welcoming E. Thomas Sullivan. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome all. Patty, thank you for that very generous introduction. Dan and Carol Birak, thank you for being here. This is an honor to be one of the speakers in your long-standing, very distinguished lectureship uh, that you both endowed for this university many, many years ago to bring conversations like this, I think, to our great campus. So Carol and Dan, thank you again. Well, this afternoon, uh, we're all here to talk about um, an easy subject, um, and it's uh, free speech. As Patty said, I want to talk about core values first, what informs and shapes the principles and the law that we have, um, and the current debates, and how they fit or align or don't with regard to what the Supreme Court says is the supreme law of the land. And I hope that my question is somewhat provocative. 
Do we have a crisis of understanding about the First Amendment speech under the Constitution? And I hope to be able to frame my remarks this afternoon to, to kind of take on those questions and to see when we leave here how much conflict or dispute or understanding or lack of understanding we, we might have. So that's how I want to frame the lecture today, to share context and to raise questions and to get you to think about and analyze where those lines are drawn between freedom of speech, civil disobedience, and speech that is not protected. Um, we want to start um, with um, looking at the core values that I mentioned that inform and animate the law that we have today. I want to draw a very clear distinction through the lecture between public speech and private speech who's doing the regulating and who's being regulated because that makes a big difference with regard to the application. Current principles and law, uh, the current debates back and forth from hate speech to campus discord. And then I want to finish with some guidelines where we can understand where the Constitution says we must be and where there is what uh, the scholars in the court call breathing space between clearly protected not so protected and fully unprotected speech. And then I want to share with you from a national perspective uh, what we're seeing on campuses with regard to regulation of speech and conduct. And I should drop a footnote here. I'm not going to be talking or referring about UVM policies and procedures, but rather the national what we're seeing uh, so that we can have that frame to think about. Um, so, with regard to values, um, our colleagues in the political science and philosophy department like to talk about instrumental values and intrinsic values. Instrumental values are, are a means to get to values that are really important. And an intrinsic value, they are values in and of themselves. So, for example, when we think about what are the values and principles that underlie the free speech rights, or the counter arguments, if you will. Well, they are such things as it helps promote a better self-government. It helps promote a more tolerant society if we respectfully and civilly listen to each other and learn from each other. It is essential to be able to promote and advance democracy, to be able to have a robustness in the speech so that we can learn and listen and debate each other without censorship or restriction by government. It empowers minority viewpoints, where otherwise the majority or the tyranny of the majority may well dominate the conversation and have a monopoly on it so that those smaller voices, those important voices, have an opportunity to get into the marketplace of ideas. And ultimately, it is about promoting civic education among all of us and civic engagement to make sure that our self-government is one that is fully informed and educated by we the people, as the Declaration of Independence speaks of. And so I want to start looking at values from an intrinsic value, a very important one. And this may seem a bit esoteric, but it's critically important to understand where we're going to go with this conversation. I happen to believe that there is an absolute, fundamental right of consciousness. If you think about the self-development of the individual, leading to a promotion of a better democracy and constitutional republic, it starts with what are thinking, good and bad, fun and sadness, all of that that goes through our mind. That helps us develop the autonomy, the personal autonomy of each other. And how we work that out individually, mentally, by ourselves. And then how we take that mental frame and how we express it verbally or through expressive speech and expression. Symbolic speech, for example. I think Oliver Wendell Holmes said it the best, who gave us the definition of the marketplace of ideas. That's what we should have as the underbelly of our Constitution. 
a robust marketplace of ideas, Holmes said, our constitution and all of life is an experiment through a competition of ideas played out in the marketplace of thought and expression. That's the fundamental piece. It's about robustness in our ability to think and to verbalize and, and debate the big issues to make us all better advocates and our country in self-government. Uh, next, after we think about the values, I want to talk about um, some of the current debates, principles, and values here. But, but first, the distinction between, um, number two, a distinction between public speech and private speech. The United States Constitution's First Amendment says Congress, I'm changing the word to mean government because it's all government, federal, state, local, public institutions. The government may not interfere with your speech rights, period. And who is that designed to protect? The speech of private citizens or entities. So it's really clear to understand from the beginning that we're talking about the government, whatever entity it is, not restricting or censoring a private person or private entity's speech. Okay? So, for example, um, I'll, I'll bring some political examples here because some of them are so clearly helpful. Uh, you may remember a couple years ago where uh, former President Trump, when he was president, when he was thrown off Twitter before, uh, when he liked Twitter and then got mad about Twitter and now he's back on X. When he said, they threw me off Twitter, they violated my First Amendment rights to speak. This is awful, on and on and on. Well, actually, that was, for the President of the United States, an incorrect interpretation of the Constitution. That was a social private platform, a private business that took him off. We don't have to debate right or wrong. And so the Constitution had nothing to say about that because it was a private party entity who was using its own values, norms, standards, censorship, whatever, to decide who gets on and who gets off. The Constitution only applies when it's a government agency doing the restricting or the censoring. Um, so that's an important distinction as we go through between public restrictions on private conduct versus private to private. Um, that is governed by um, what we call in our book the everyday First Amendment. Private entities like social medias or private universities, while they are not regulated by the First Amendment speech, they're not controlled by that, they often will emulate, adopt, embrace the values that we talked about a minute ago coming out of the First Amendment. And they'll have their own norms and their own standards and their own ethics. So they may borrow from, but again, they're not restricted by the United States Constitution. So for those of you who have been around a while, you know that our Friends in Middlebury College who six, seven years ago had some, some substantial demonstrations and uh, criminal conduct associated with it. That's a private institution. The First Amendment speech has no regulation over Middlebury's First Amendment use, norms, standards, etc. cetera. Um, now I want to turn next to um, some of the current developments and principles. And first of all, I want to be as clear as I can and hopefully honest with you as I can. Um, I'm going to be talking descriptively. I'm going to be as, as straight and honest as I can about what the actual law is today. And I will try or I'll let you know when I slip over into the normative, my own opinion. But uh, it's important to know exactly what the law says so that we can say, okay, I understand, or I believe that, or, or that's terrible, we need to change that. So I'm going to try to be very descriptive. Um, and, and let me summarize the two or 300 pages in this, in this book, right here in a sentence. Um, 
the United States Supreme Court, and this is not a red-blue partisan um, divide. No, most of these First Amendment cases are unanimous or 7-2 or 6-3. There's not a big divide on this because of the legacy and the history of Oliver Wendell Holmes' marketplace of ideas, robustness, almost let anything go and hopefully the truth will prevail at some point, or better understanding at least will prevail. Um, so we have a court that says all of this sweep broad is protected speech. Government cannot interfere with private speech or expressive speech. But there are four exceptions that have been carved out since uh, 1791, the Bill of Rights, or m more recently, 1919, when it was the first time that the court decided that, hey, those people actually have some rights under the First Amendment. 1919 was the very first time the court recognized that from 1791. Um, and what are those four exceptions very quickly? Defamation. Uh, defamation, obscenity, defamation is slander written or oral. Obscenity, I th even though the court says they don't know what that is, they just know when they see it. I'm not going to define it either. Uh, but I will say, well, I will do say this so that everybody gets comfortable. The, the state of the law on obscenity right now is as long as it's done by adults, just fine. When it's targeted or affects children, they're coming after you with a criminal statute. Exception, no free speech protection. You've all heard this wonderful phrase by uh, the Holmes Court, clear and present danger. You've all heard that aphorism of, uh, you don't have a First Amendment right to yell uh, fire in a theater when there's no fire. Security of the crowd and so forth. Uh, clear and present danger. I want you to remember those terms. It's morphed over the years into fighting words doctrine. And more recently and more accurately by the court's term, it's now called the true threat test. I'm going to spend a considerable amount of time in a minute on that. Um, so the aperture of, of the First Amendment is wide open, much broader than a lot of people would like, quite frankly. And the reason for the breadth of that is because the court has said, we want to have some breathing space, literally breathing space, from where we think the line of speech protection should be to actually where we're going to put it so that if we make a mistake, we won't chill important speech that we may have lost because we cut it too short. That's the breathing space doctrine. Um, so there's the law. Absolute right except those four exceptions. Defamation, obscenity, clear and present danger, true threat. And the last one I want to mention, which is really important in our contemporary society, speech that is incident or part of a crime is not protected speech. Think January 6th. Speech as incident or part of a crime is not January 6th. It is, it is, speech incident to a crime is not protected. And we can talk about January 6th later if, if you don't quite get that analogy. Um, so let's drop back, now that we have the doctrine and principle, when can the government or a public entity, a public university, for example, when can they begin to worry about other issues and set some parameters about how those free speech rights can be enacted? Um, and here I want to introduce you to um, um, page seven on the reasonable time, place, manner restrictions. The Supreme Court has said, even though we have these very broad, very broad rights, there are times when the public institution can set reasonable time, place, manner restrictions. Now, these are not as broad as they may read that way. Um, so, for example, we do not let the government or, or the ins governmental institution get too deep into the content what they want to regulate. We say that the content or the speech from the institution must be neutral. It must, there must be neutrality in the government's opinion. You can't, as a government, public university or the federal government can't start saying, we're going to outlaw or restrict X and then get deep into the details of X. 
Um, that is government viewpoint. The neutrality means you can't favor, you can't disfavor, you have to be even handed to all sides in the regulations that you set up. And they must apply to everything that falls within the context of the regulations. You can't pick and choose your politics or your friends in that regard. Um, the restrictions uh, must be, I believe, in writing. There must be, they must be clear. You shouldn't have to guess at what's the prohibitive line. And they must be accessible. Uh, and this satisfies, or arguably doesn't satisfy, the due process clause of the United States Constitution, Fifth Amendment or Fourteenth Amendment. Due process says if the government's going to mess with you, that's my language, there has to be adequate notice so that you understand where the guardrails and the boundaries are. You shouldn't have to guess at it. Um, it must be uh, uh, neutral, as I said. It must be clear notice so that you will have an opportunity to defend yourself if there are bad consequences. Notice, written, accessible, clear, not ambiguous, not invidious, uh, picking and choosing and discriminating favorably or unfavorably. Um, and, the, and the language can't be overbroad. You've got a problem you're trying to regulate, you can't regulate this. It's overbroad and unconstitutional. And it can't be so vague that you have to guess. The person is about to be arrested. Kelly, I didn't know it said that. What did that really mean? It has to be clear enough. Not perfect, but clear enough so that there is no vagueness problem. And so then we have public institutions have to step back and think, OK, we've got a, we've got a problem here. We've got a demonstration, whatever. What I call the risk, threat, safety analysis. Remember, the government can put reasonable time, place, manners to protect the security and safety of the community, campus, whatever, whatever the space or place is. And so here, uh, enforcement officials, government officials have to look at and have evidence to show, by the way, in case they get sued, what are the pieces of evidence or the data that su suggests that we have a real threat here? What are the security implications. Can we manage those so that somebody isn't hurt or, or, or property is destroyed? So that risk, threat, safety analysis becomes very critical to whether the government can introduce and enforce a reasonable time, place, manner restriction. So let me next turn to um, the true threat test. Um, page eight. Because this is where the, what, use, a, use a common term, where the rubber hits the road. This is where the big debate is today. Um, one of the big, most controversial topics, as we all know, and we all think we understand what it is, is hate speech. Hate speech is vile, offensive, nasty, awful. I mean, really awful, and there are cases where the Supreme Court has taken this up that even I looked at it and said, this can't possibly be protected. And they said it was. So that's what we label as hate speech. The United States Supreme Court today has held hate speech is First Amendment protected. Now, how's that for an argument? We all have opinions about that. But let me quickly go through, again, except one of the four exceptions, defamation, obscenity, clear and present danger, fighting words. Well, let's just take one of those. The most prevalent uh, exception that would apply here is the true threat test. Clear and present, fighting words, true threat. Let me go through carefully with you how strict and narrow this standard is in order to uh, be in an exception and be not protected speech. True threat test. There must be, and this goes to threats, intimidation, or harassment. So think about those words. Threats, intimidation or harassment, how they may be a part of your life or someone else in your life. The threat, intimidation, or harassment must be direct. Dan, I'm coming after you. Dan, I'm coming after you. Or a group of people, race, religion, culture, a group of people. You folks, direct threat. 
It must be imminent time, right now, right now, not next week, right now, I'm putting you in, th in danger. And it must be a likelihood that the threat will lead to physical injury. Physical injury. Now, I pause because most of this injury, at least initially, may well be mental injury, mental trauma from a threat. And the Chief Justice went out of his way, I thought, in an opinion two years ago where he said, and emotional distress and threat does not count within the true threat test. That's something a, a lot of us would like to argue about, given the research in psychology and psychiatry about the relationships between physical injury, physical harm, and mental trauma, and so forth. So the likelihood that the speech will lead to physical harm. And the last prong there is lawlessness. Lawlessness, that the speech will lead to lawlessness in conduct, a crime, for example, something that violates the law. Now, if it's a criminal charge, I have to add one more. Because in all criminal cases, the prosecution must show not only the conduct that violates the law, but willfulness, intent. So in a criminal case, if you've got a threat, harassment or intimidation case, you also have to show the willfulness, the intent of the speaker to harm under the circumstances I just met. Not necessary in a civil case. So again, direct and aimed at a person or a defined specific group of people. Right now, in the present time, likelihood that the speech will physically, and phys likely means, by the way, probably, something more than 50% likelihood that it will lead to physical harm. And then lawlessness, as I said, means illegal, uh, the threat or intimidation uh, or, or, or harassment is in fact uh, I illegal. Um, so those are the criteria. So when we look at hate speech, this vile and, and upsetting, that's going to be protected, this Supreme Court says, unless you follow to the nail, to the specific detail, those four uh, requirements by the court. And again, what we look at here is whether the targeting or the threat is to a particular individual. I can give you many examples if you would like during our question and answer period. Uh, but speech which is merely persuasive, kind of advocacy or political rhetoric, or an advertisement or a poster, that's not going to meet the true threat test, probably. Because that's probably going to a general audience as opposed to specific groups or individuals. So it's really looking at whether the verbal advocacy is a call to action. Think January 6th. Come to Washington on January 6th. Come to Washington so we can pre prevent the steal. And they came to Washington by the thousands. Offer, acceptance, and the consideration is we're going down to the Capitol and we are going to stop the steal and stop the certification. Does that fit into the true threat test? Uh, is that fit into the clear and present danger test? Does that fit into speech which is incident or part of a crime? That's what our courts are trying to decide right now. But it's that verbal adequacy. Does it push to call to action? Let's go. And I'm going with you. Actually, in that case, he did get in the car. And it was a secret service on the way to the Capitol that said, no, we're not, and brought him back because of the security risks. So it's the likelihood, the probability, that that's going to lead to violence or physical harm. And, and we really look at the, um, that whether the speech will incent or produce that imminent lawless effect. That's one of the ways we look at uh, the exceptions here. Um, also, uh, on the current debates, uh, mentioned hate speech, cancel culture. 
Well, we've heard a lot about that. Everybody kind of has their own definition of cancel culture, depending upon where you are. Well, cancel culture really means when the government is attempting to interfere, change um, culture, social, his historical, or educational um, backgrounds, values, and so forth, like, it, like they never existed. That's, that's a violation, quite frankly, of free speech rights to ignore, to eliminate from a, an official standpoint. Like a governor or a legislature saying the following books will not be in our library. The following books will not be taught in our classroom. The classrooms will not have the following curriculum taught. Um, and you can fill in your favorite subjects that should be taught that are now banned. Cancel culture. Government interfering with First Amendment speech rights and assembly rights, perhaps. Campaign finance. My, this is one that gets everyone broiled. Um, uh, this is Citizens United a couple years ago by the United States Supreme Court. Can the government, this, in this case it was the Congress, can the government regulate campaign financing because of the problems of potential criminal quid pro quo bribery, et cetera? And the Supreme Court said, it is unconstitutional under the First Amendment speech to tr attempt to regulate campaign expenditures. That's the money coming out of the PACs or the party that go to pay for everything. Because they said money is speech. It is symbolic speech. When you pay, you're supporting, and that's symbolic speech. Government can't regulate it. Highly controversial decision. Uh, academic freedom, uh, First Amendment implications. I believe academic freedom is a um, subcategory of the First Amendment, which is a special constitutional protection for faculty. And I even make the argument for students in certain circumstances. Um, I will tell you that um, I, I've been in the academy for um, a long time. Um, and an administrator for over 30 years. And um, I, guess, I think this is my um, 45th year of in the academy teaching administration or both. I always thought I knew what academic freedom was because I was in that classroom all the time. Well, when I went to write the chapter, I had to read all the cases again, and I was shocked. There is wonderful fl rhetorical flourishes, phenomenal jurisprudence and theory fl flourishes in the case. Justice Frankfurter, Justice Douglas, both who had been law professors at Yale and Harvard, talking about the importance and fundamental nature of academic freedom in the classroom and scholarship and research. Not one Supreme Court opinion ever held that there is, in fact, a protective academic freedom doctrine. Not one. And when you look at the recent uh, dicta from the court and the lower courts, I think academic freedom today is going to be limited if it is ever recognized. And I'm, I have my doubts, quite frankly. It will only pertain to teaching in the classroom or in the hallway, as many of us do a lot of, the actual teaching function, teaching learning function, and our scholarship and research. Everything else that a faculty member may do at a university, this Supreme Court's not going to call that academic freedom. That's extra service duty. So I think we need to watch carefully how the court limits. And there are court members who have already said they don't believe there's any special privilege for faculty in the classroom or their scholarship. Internet speech, I don't have to talk much about digital speech. Private platforms setting their own values, standards, norms, and ethics, or not. Um, the First Amendment has no restrictions on them because it's a private entity, something uh, President Trump missed. And then finally, uh, I want to mention two others, compelled speech uh, or, or a compelled learning environment. The court has become very big on protecting compelled speech. So in a classroom, faculty have to be very careful that the, their comments in that contained environment, that captured audience, is about the relevant and germane content of the subject matter of the class. Otherwise, the university could be sued, the faculty member could be sued for violating the First Amendment rights of the students to listen and to learn in an environment where they're paying tuition for a particular subject and not this other stuff. Maybe highly critical, but relevant and germane to the topic. Um, and then finally, um, another quite controversial topic, and my last one I want to just underscore here, is the right of association. 
That's a term, by the way, association, that does never appear in the United States Constitution. It's not in the First Amendment. The Supreme Court made it up. Rightly so, I think, but they made it up. And that's important because we now have justices saying, well, if the word isn't in the Constitution, you don't have the right. Well, I could give you a list of at least 30 examples where the court implied or inferred and decided on a particular right based on a word that doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution. Think about the abortion decisions, the right of privacy, the personal autonomy of the individual. Justice Alito says the word privacy never appears, therefore it was wrong when it was decided, it's wrong today, no right to an abortion. Well, actually, it emanates directly from the liberty provision of life, liberty, and property in the due process clause in the 14th. It is directly related to that. And the entire uh, first eight amendments to the Bill of Rights are all about the private integrity and privacy of the individual. So that's where we are with the court. I also was thinking, um, teaching a class the other day on this subject, I thought, you know, what's not in the Constitution that's been so sacred in our judicial system? The words judicial review. In 1803, Marbury versus Madison, Chief Justice Marshall enshrined the Supreme Court art under Article III is supreme in deciding all federal questions and also relationship quest state questions that, re that implicate the Constitution. Judicial review is supreme. That means the Supreme Court tells us what the Constitution says, not what the Constitution says. Well, now there's a term that appears nowhere in the Constitution. Yet it is the guiding principle by which our Supreme Court has become supreme and sovereign. Um, so let me go back to next to our last two items, and then we will get to some good questions, I hope. Guidelines for public instruction. <coughs> I mentioned some of these. I want to underscore them. Institutional, if the government, public institution, wants to regulate under reasonable time, place, manner restrictions, institutional neutrality. They have to be neutral. They can't be uneven in their application. We favor this, we disfavor that. That would be unconstitutional. Written rules um, with regard to uh, policies, practices, procedures of the government entity, as I mentioned, content neutral, neutrality, um, have to be narrowly drawn and a narrow application, so they're not overbroad, shooting too far in their, their application. Um, and then um, clearly written in advance, notice, due process, accessible, um, and well written so that they can be understood um, by the reasonable person. And I mentioned earlier, let me underscore, due process concerns, the notice must be in advance, person has to have a reasonable opportunity to defend oneself if the government decides to uh, issue sanctions or pen, punishments. And, and the courts have said, where's the line drawing? We don't want people to have to actually guess at what those words mean. If they do, it's unconstitutional vague under the due process clause. Can't be arbitrary, governmental rules. Uh, reasonable people must be able to understand them uh, and it can't be invidious selecting favoritism. So the legal analysis here, bringing all this to bear, uh, comes down to number one, First Amendment rights of speech are incredibly broad, and rightly so. Number two, except if you've got the four exceptions. Next point, there can be reasonable time, place, manner, must be central, neutral, uh, must be clearly and narrowly focused, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so then you have to balance those legal principles and rules with the test I mentioned earlier, threat, safety, security of the community, and how you balance in the lived experience, right now on a campus or some place downtown, et cetera, how governmental officials balance these very protected rights with the safety of the community uh, that they're dealing with. Um, well, let me begin to conclude by mentioning that there are kind of three categories, and I think we can understand them pretty clearly. Number one, um, protected speech. 
protected unless one of the four exceptions apply. Okay, clear, clear line. Um, number two, civil disobedience. Those of us who have been uh, living and watching and observing uh, civil rights marches in the 50s and the 60s and the Vietnam marches in the 60s and 70s, civil disobedience is when you know what the law is, you know you're gonna march, uh, and that march will be in violation of the law, but you are willing to take the consequences of the sanctions or the penalties. It's a matter of principle. I know I'm gonna be arrested, but this is principle, we're doing it anyway. Civil disobedience, a great respectful uh, conduct in our history. And then the third category is the unprotected speech, when, when the speech, speech expression, falls into one of the exceptions that I just mentioned. Exceptions meaning it is not protected speech. Defamation, obscenity, clear and present, true threat, and speech incident to a crime. So let me conclude uh, with looking at uh, examples on college campuses today. Again, I'm speaking from a national perspective. I've gone through and looked at a lot of uh, last spring's incidences and what the rules are, uh, were, and I just wanna run through them for you now with the frame of reference we've been talking about, for you to be able to kind of debate among yourself, your consciousness, remember, and kind of think about where's that line? Where is that line? So here's what we see across the national landscape. Uh, no overnight sleeping. Um, no unauthorized structures, physical structures. No tents or encampments. No takeovers of buildings or offices. No denying access to buildings. No denying access to educational opportunities. That's Title IX, a federal statute. No use of billhorns without prior approval. Now that sounds a little tough, but the reason there may be a rational justification for that is uh, because those, those louder voices may well disrupt normal university business. Whether it's, take this building for example. We have many classrooms up here, inter interfering, disrupting the classroom because somebody's marching in the hallway, administrative offices, um, so, so that the bullhorn's reasonable, so you're not disrupting and we have to shut down a class because we can't have a learning environment, may be argued to be reasonable. Uh, wearing a mask or a face clothing prohibited, uh, well, that might, might be reasonable, you, it's arguable, under um, if you're wearing it to disguise your identity uh, for two reasons. Number one, if that's trying to avoid proper legal police oversight of the campus for safety and health reasons, or if uh, you have uh, uh, a health issue involved, COVID, for example, um, or, or if uh, there's a religious reason to be able to wear a face garment. There are exceptions, but there are also public safety concerns about uh, masking one's face uh, to ensure lawful uh, legal enforcement. Um, and also, as we saw vividly from the Columbia University demonstrations and the UCLA demonstrations, um, I remember seeing the mayor of New York in a press conference saying, we are able in the police department, I don't know if it's true or not, over half of the people in the Columbia campus demonstrating today are outsiders. They are not members, faculty, staff, students, or alums of this university. So in, in controlling, you may want to control only our campus constituency, staff, faculty, students, and alumni. Outsiders, outside agitators, no. Draw a line, court may well re find that reasonable under the circumstances if you can prove through that threat, threat uh, safety uh, analysis I mentioned with data uh, that, that the police had this kind of information. Um, prior approval of space, well, again, that's for crowd control and safety. Um, many universities have this long before the demonstrations on campus. And the reason was, you know, uh, you have to sign up for a particular room if you want to assign a room. Well, we all know if we've tried to assign, get a room in this university, it's very hard to get one, I can assure you. <laughs> tried yesterday, impossible. But if you're lucky, uh, then we'll say, well, we're gonna, then, then um, university officials will ask, how many are you expecting? 
well, that room isn't going to be able to handle it for the crowd, crowd control, or security of the people there in case there's a problem. So, so that seems to be reasonable in terms of helping you identify spaces which are going to be safe for you and the university community. Um, crowd control safety. Um, and then I mentioned earlier uh, other problems of compelled speech on com campus, compelled listening uh, in the classroom uh, uh, or, or well beyond. Um, so in conclusion, I think we're going to have a good half hour almost for questions and answers. In conclusion, the present state of the law, whether we like it or not, because of these animating values that have been identified and embraced over many, many years, is wide, broad, expansive, so that we create spaces for opportunities for listening and learning and debating, and then that breathing space so that we don't make a mistake, even though it seems overly restrictive. And I'm thinking about a historical comment there. Benjamin Franklin once said to this breathing space issue, um, you know, two years ago, I was in London for the coronation of King the, uh, George III. Thought he was fabulous, really rooting for the king. And two years later, I'm part of the Revolutionary War, and I'm a leader here in Philadelphia in the Constitutional Convention. I was wrong. So maybe we need that, that breathing space for all of us to be wrong, and to learn, and to listen, and have that experience. Um, but again, the design of the First Amendment is to have as robust and engaging and thoughtful competition of ideas in this big marketplace of thought and experience. But the government does have a role to play at times, a smaller role given the primacy of that speech right. Reasonable time, place, manner restrictions. Content neutral, narrowly drawn, equally applied, no favoritism, disfavoritism, equal handedness to be able to balance and in the context and situation of the place and time to make sure that we're supporting the rights but at the same time we're protecting for safety and security reasons the community uh, that we're trying to uh, support. And finally and very importantly those due process rights from the 5th and 14th Amendment. Whatever the government or the regulatory agency is trying to regulate, it must be clear. I believe it must be in writing for clear notice. It has to be narrowly drawn. It can't be overbroad to cover way too much beyond the problem at hand. And it must be reasonable for the person who might suffer the consequences to know what the law was. And that brings us back to free speech rights, civil disobedience, and unprotected speech. Thank you very much. <laughs> Your questions, please. Free speech, good debate, please. Yes, Lisa, please. Thank you very much. Um, my question is about um, a, a comment you made early. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> my comment, my question is about a comment that you made early on about how many of these cases are not ideological and they're often kind of one-sided, and that's obviously <clears throat> accurate for you know the big cases <clears throat> that deal with the big fundamental principles. But there are examples of cases where the court is very divided down ideological lines. And one recently was the case out of California that made a distinction between the free speech rights of crisis pregnancy centers and the free speech rights of abortion providers and what the state can or cannot do to force them to speak. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. In the political science world, there is literature that shows that in free speech cases, some of these trickier cases are being motivated by ideology. And by, by the justices. By the justices, yeah. including justices ruling in favor or against free speech rights based on whether the justice would presumably agree or disagree with the speaker. Right, so, and so I'm just wondering if you could comment on that, that sure. in some of these trickier cases, what is getting defined as a reasonable government regulation does seem to be getting driven by ideology. Very good question, Professor Holmes, thank you. You're exactly right, and if you look at the, uh, we'll take the abortion Planned Parenthood cases. If you look at all of those cases together, you'll see a clear trend. 
initially the court was concerned and looking at the protection of the patient, the family going into the clinic, the staff of the clinic for their safety and protection. More recently, to your point, we see the court, the more conservative side of the court, being much more concerned about the protesters outside who may want to be intimidating the patients and family going in. So there's a real dichotomy between looking at the, the holdings in those cases and the time periods. And I think you're right about, is there an ideological shift here? Um, w one example of the fences, the court, if you can believe this, our United States Supreme Court fussing over the length uh, of the fence, 20 feet away from the sidewalk to the clinic or 52 feet, et cetera. Really? Well, um, I was in Washington back a bit um, when there were demonstrations after the abortion decision, um, Dobbs came down, and the court had to put up a big fence around the Supreme Court to presumably protect the justices from the demonstrators outside. And I looked at the fence and I thought, wow, those fences are much broader <laughs> than, the, th than the Planned Parenthood fences. To your point. Please. Yes. Yes. Uh, to speak on the wave of encampments that occurred in, you know, protesting the current war in Gaza, um, you say here that encampments, structures, uh, erecting structures, and just you know, generally, being outside in such in such encampments is not constitutionally protected. No, no, no. I was raising it as a descriptive matter. Understood. I wasn't giving you an answer. I said arguable or debatable or contestable. Understood, understood. I mean, you know, we, obviously what you've been describing has been descriptive. You're not really adding in your own stances. But uh, to speak on UVM's current pending litigation around suppression of pro-Palestinian pro protest, I mean, encampments, structures, erecting structures, that's all protected under Occupy Wall Street cases, isn't it? The Supreme Court ruled right. that following Occupy. I, I didn't get the last piece of your question. Wall Street? Uh, following Occupy Wall Street was not erecting tents, setting up encampments. That was considered protected speech on the Supreme Court decisions after the, that, yes? The framework which I was suggesting is, is there a reasonable restriction, time, place, manner, when you're looking at the threat risk analysis and the university's obligation, legal and fiduciary, for the safety and welfare of the campus. Now that's a law enforcement decision, and I was suggesting that there needs to be solid, good police investigation, evidence, documentation of the, and then we go back to the threat test, of the threat. What is the level of the threat? Is it targeted to a group, et cetera, et cetera? And that's the basis on which a university under the First Amendment either can restrict or cannot restrict. And, the and, and the point about tents overnight or encampments is an is a institutional or a police concern about safety and the welfare of people at night when it's dark uh, and outsiders coming into the campus. So it, it, you, we have to balance that. And that's a situational context. That's a fact-oriented, contextual situation. It's hard to generalize about it. Yeah. You, you, it that's the lived experience, so to speak, that I mentioned. Yes, please. Thank you for your lecture. Um, I'm Trina from that library, as library Trina. professor. Uh, since the First Amendment, as you clearly said in the beginning, applies to public or governmental agencies restricting, re restricting uh, speech, my question for you is, is there a clear definition of what makes a public entity? So it seems clear to me the Fletcher Free Library, it's getting all its revenue from tax revenue. It's a department of the city of Burlington. That's obviously a public entity. Yes. The University of Vermont, is it a public entity, even though our appropriation from the state is tiny? Um, so I'm, I'm curious, what is, is there a clear place to go for that definition? Thank uh, you. Excellent question, and, and it's, um, again, situational. Um, the United States government, state government, city, county government, um, public institutions. We are chartered um, um, 1956 by the state of Vermont. All before that, we were a private institution. Heavens, if we would have stayed that way. But in 56, we got a public charter, so we officially became public. 
and as I tell my class when we get into this conversation, Patty, you're not, I don't, you don't have to agree with this. Um, when I was in this building, 3% of our operating budget came from the state of Vermont. Is that public? Chartered by the, so it's, what are the charting, chartering documents? What is the history of perception of what it always was? And let me give you an example of, speaking of UBM. Um, so uh, let me give you something, Cornell University. Anybody here, Cornell, Cornell University? Private Ivy League. Yep, private and public. My point, Ellen, private and public. It gets more money from the state of New York for what they call, well, they call them the, the endowment colleges and the non-endowment colleges, which are agriculture and, and engineering, et cetera. Uh, so there you have a private Ivy. University of Pennsylvania is the same way, where you have enormous public funds coming in but they're treated as private. But somebody could make the argument, it's really public, therefore First Amendment applies, unlike being Penn or Cornell, First Amendment doesn't apply. Very good question, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I, I wanna bring up uh, the, the leading case in the Supreme Court against speech codes, because you didn't talk about RAV. Uh, RAV, 1992 used the concept of viewpoint neutrality and the many many speech codes that have been created on college campuses sometimes uh, in cities never refer to RAV because the concept of viewpoint neutrality makes it very difficult to prosecute people um, in Stanford, it's the Stanford Code in 1995 added to this because it was, it was uh, the, the 1992 thing was a city law, but in 1995 they were looking at a university speech code. It was struck down because it didn't meet the test of viewpoint neutrality. Um, when I look around uh, the country over the last few years and although I'm not originally from Vermont, I'm a recent Vermonter, when I look at uh, what happened uh, at the University of Vermont in 218, I see a complete failure to recognize how <coughs> difficult it is to prosecute uh, these, these cases. Uh, and in many cases, they shouldn't be prosecuted. For example, in 218, Wesley Richter said something in the library. He was tattled on by a student. The case went to court. Uh, the prosecutor took it on. The judge threw it out. He said he didn't, the, the, the testimony was unreliable. Wesley Richter's reputation was destroyed. And I want to add on th uh, one other thing, which is particularly relevant now uh, with the Palestinian protests. Over the years, a number of universities have essentially prosecuted Palestinians or pro-Palestinians. Norman Finkelstein was essentially prosecuted at DePaul. Rashid Khalidi was essentially prosecuted uh, at, at Columbia. Uh, and Salady, Salata, in a very well-documented case, was essentially prosecuted at the University of Illinois. None of these prosecutions of Palestinians had anything to do with any form, any possible form of due process or viewpoint neutrality. Let me um, take your points uh, and decouple them just a bit. <clears throat> I'm not con uh, um, aware of some of those later data historical points, but let me put it back in the context of the framework we talked about. And you mentioned the St. Paul case. Um, the St. Paul case was a very interesting case which brings together a lot of what we've talked about this afternoon. In that case, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of Minnesota said um, that the language of the statute is vague to Im implicate the due process cl clause of not notice. But we're going to interpret that as a judicial decision to embrace uh, um, fighting words doctrine. So that took care of the vagueness problem. It come back, comes back later to the United States Supreme Court, and the problem was the neutrality of the, the city council of St. Paul that was trying to do the best thing they can here. 
this was uh, very well intended, but their lawyer got a, a little challenged in writing the ordinance. And what the court said was, you cross the line and your language in it was too specific, content, not content neutral, but content favoring and disfavoring. So they struck it down based upon content and viewpoint discrimination, even though it was completely well intended by the, by the uh, um, city council in St. Paul. Um, a, a piece of personal history. You started with uh, speech codes on campuses. When I was a faculty member at Washington University in St. Louis, and I was chairing the university's overall student honor committee, the chancellor came to me, Bill Danforth, and he said, Tom, would you, now this was um, 1985, would you write us a speech code? And um, at the time, I wasn't teaching constitutional law or constitutional history, so I had to. And I said, Bill, let me, let me think about this. And a couple days later, we met, and I said, no, I can't do it. Because in my view, the speech codes that were being developed then were so vague that they would violate the due process clause. Now, in the book that we have, we have identified 350 university speech codes who were, that were litigated all of them found to be unconstitutional. And I'm talking about prior speech codes long before current controversies, okay? So universities have a heavy burden on the criteria that I talked about, reasonable time, place, manner, specificity, neutrality, uh, narrowly defined, clarity, et cetera. Because the track record, as you imply, is a heavy burden for a governmental entity to uh, defend restrictions on free speech rights. Yes, please, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could speak at all to something I've been noticing in the past couple of years, which is the proliferation of bans on drag performance as an issue of First Amendment rights, and if in your research you found any precedents or if it fits in the framework kind of banning on a type of entertainment or a form of entertainment as something that shouldn't happen on public lands or I think the language of one of these drag bands was where children may see it. Uh, excellent question and if it, the, 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 the court would be likely to look at it if it were accessible to children or targeted at children and I think we all fully understand that. But assuming no, I think it's fully protected. Um, whatever one thinks about the taste or the style or whatever. Um, I had a student two years ago in my free speech seminar write a paper on satire and comedy and, and, and really some rough, dark stuff. And I learned a lot from that student newspaper. And the answer is that's fully protected, unless it gets tipping into that obscenity reaching children. But if it's adult activity, protected. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Tom. This was really um, helpful and informative and really helps to frame these discussions. Um, I'd like to ask about how this relates, like in the classroom. If I heard you right, um, mm -hmm. you were saying that like there's no special protection for faculty um, in the classroom, at least according to precedent at the Supreme Court level. But I wonder how the rights of faculty in relationship to the guidelines that have been set up, sort of establishment of the parameters from government, um, impact that relationship. For example, here at UVM, we have policies um, supporting the 1940s uh, AAUP principles on academic freedom, which specifically lays out certain, certain, you know, free speech rights mm -hmm. of faculty. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that really set sort of the precedent from which faculty should expect that their rights would be protected all the way up through the Supreme Court? That's what I thought. <laughs> I, was, I was literally shocked when I read all the cases after all these years of professing this stuff about academic freedom and the importance and the centrality of it to the intellectual debate. But that's not where the courts are. Um, so let me connect two dots there, uh, because I think you implied first about compelled speech, and then we got off to. So um, 
let me summarize where I think the law is, and this just reinforces what I said before. I think descriptively, if the Supreme Court were to take this up, that the most faculty could get out of this is academic freedom protected under the First Amendment for what is in your realm of teaching. Now, I would broaden that beyond a classroom because I know a lot of us do it right out in the hallways before and after class, but it's a teaching and educational moment. That has to be protected. Second, in our scholarship or research, that has to be protected. Maybe they will give us that. Anything else over and beyond that? I'm afraid it's not close. Let me give you some examples. How many of the faculty here are on the faculty senate? Faculty university committees, faculty department committees, um, all the service re responsibilities and obligations we do and should be doing, not protected by academic freedom under the law as it now appears. It's that very narrow classroom learning moment or our scholarship and our teaching. Now let me connect that to compelled speech, which I mentioned earlier. And here, here we're going to get due, due respect to my faculty colleagues. Here we're going to get a little uh, debate. Uh, do we have any chemists here? Well, we have a scientist here. Chemist, I like to. There we go. So, a brilliant chemist has a chemistry class, organic or whatever. And all of a sudden, here we are in an election year, and you decide you want to go in and give over your 50 minutes to talking about the election and the polls and the candidates, and you wear maybe a provocative T-shirt. I want to talk about public health. Well, 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 I'm seeing how close that gets. Um, the, 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 the law, and I believe, again, I don't want to comment on UVM, but the law, I believe, or the rules here at UVM is it must be related and germane to the subject matter of the course. So if the health scientist wants to go in and say how you love or hate Donald Trump, or you wear a t-shirt, I love Joe Biden or I hate Joe Biden, teaching organic, or health, that is not, that's not your protected speech. The students, captive audience, they're for organic or health, but not for politics, election, right or left. They're paying tuition. You've got to, we have a contract with them that we will teach you X. Not have a conversation because it's not voluntary on their part. So why are they compelled to be there? Can't they just withdraw their money and leave? No, because they've, there's a contract here on contract law. We offered, they accepted, they paid tuition, and there's an expectation that we will teach them X. Just seems Not weak. get off in a rant about our own emotions. Now that's why I said, I'm faculty, really? I can't wear that provocative t-shirt? Take the t-shirt off, walk out in the classroom, walk right a couple steps and have at it. Not in a captured audience. What's the parallel? Most universities, including UVM, I believe, we have rules against faculty dating students. Power, dominance, control, we grade, they must follow Great suit. Great rules. Pardon me? Good rules. Power, dom you get the, the, the uh, analogy. So that's why I think the compelled speech, students have constitutional rights on the other side to listen, to learn, to debate, and if they feel chilled or stifled because you got this view and we're supposed to be teaching this, you don't have that constitutional right. They do, to receive and to listen what I paid tuition for. Sorry for the provocative example, but uh, compelled speech. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you the Supreme Court's recent compelled speech case. Again, this will get a lot of our faculty uh, union folks uh, upset, as it does me. Um, the early case on um, union dues, the Supreme Court said, um, if you're a member of the union, that's a voluntary joining. And you will pay union dues for the benefit of what you get from the union representation. However, if you're not a union member and you don't want to be a union member, the court first said, you can't charge the non-union member for the free rider benefit they're getting by reason of positive benefits on behalf of the union. They said that was compelled speech. Then the law changed when the economists got involved 
and said, wait a minute, that's a classic free rider problem. The non-member union faculty are getting real benefits when the union is successful, and they're paying nothing. It's a free rider. It's, it's, it's a broken market concept. Court bought that. And three years ago, they reversed themselves and said, no, you cannot charge a non-faculty union member for a fee because that is compelled speech under the Constitution. They are paying for something they don't want. That's the state of the law, highly controversial today for all the obvious reasons. Other questions? Yes, Ellen, please. talking about the way that the 14th Amendment is mm -hmm. used to incorporate the First Amendment. Right. Uh, I'm talking about what happens when things like free speech come up against core 14th Amendment practices like uh, the guarantee of equal protection. And I'm thinking particularly about the 303 uh, Creatives versus Alanis, right? Recent Supreme Court case uh, <laughs> involving um, uh, a person who wanted to enter the area of web designing for marriages but did not want to include same-sex couples. Um, Oregon determined that that was a violation of Oregon law uh, against uh, uh, discrimination in the context of public accommodations, et cetera. Right. right. <clears throat> the Supreme Court read this as a, as a First Amendment case. Yes and ruled in favor of um, 303 Creative, which leads us to the question about how do you balance two rights that come into conflict with one another? Well, the court has done that. Yes, and I'm asking you to talk about it. And you and I, don't disagree, you and I agree that the court's wrong. <laughs> so let me, <clears throat> let me go back and explain uh, Ellen's great question. <clears throat> um, it's complicated, but let me see if I can uh, grab it quickly. Um, Ellen's question was, um, the Supreme Court has said that the First Amendment speech rights are prima, primary, primacy over everything else. And they, their easy answer to that is, well, it's number one in the Bill of Rights, therefore primacy. Little shallow leak argument. But nevertheless, the Supreme Court has said it sits over every other right, that First Amendment, uh, the Bill of Rights. So then, the, the cases she's citing is, you have a federal and state in Texas and, and in the second state, anti-discrimination laws. You cannot discriminate based upon gay rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have an absolute clash between the First Amendment, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, and federal and state uh, anti-discrimination laws. And the Supreme Court said the United States Constitution is preeminent over every inconsistency. We know that from uh, interpretation. So here is the first case, Ellen's two examples are the first case that I know where the Supreme Court had a direct challenge of a 14th Amendment e equal protection equality argument coming right up against the primacy of First Amendment speech. And the court opted and said, clearly, First Amendment speech overrides. Some people say Trump's. I don't like to use that term. Overrides the federal and clear and, and state anti-discrimination statute. So let's go back to the scholarship which you know so well. This issue all, uh, let me be clear about the facts of those cases if you don't know them. So the first case was a fellow in Texas, a baker in Texas. A uh, gay couple comes in and says, we want, we want, we're getting married and we want to have a cake and he refuses to sell them a cake that he designs. They can get a cake that's already designed and in the case over there, but he is not gonna make them a specialized cake which they wish to have. That case goes up with that discrimination and the Supreme Court ruled First Amendment speech, compelled speech, make a cake I don't want because it's against my religious values, so he argued. So in that case, you had both First Amendment speech and First Amendment exercise of one's own religion, free exercise clause. Second case camp comes up, similar, which, which shocked me even more, was th this woman who says, uh, I'm gonna do an online bakery, food, whatever, and I wanna know whether I can do that and not have to uh, have gay people as my clients. Supreme Court took this case up and, and it was absolutely shocking because 
Normally in uh, constitutional jurisprudence, we would say that case is not ripe. She hasn't even started her business. The Supreme Court is not entitled about, under their jurisdiction to give an advisory opinion. Under Article uh, um, 3, there must be a real case or controversy. But yet they took it anyway. Shocking. And they ruled the same thing. Even though she hasn't built her building, she probably will. And free exercise clause, her religion overcomes the anti-discrimination statute. And they threw in the First Amendment too. So again, normative versus descriptive. Descriptive, that's where the Supreme Court is. I tell my students kind of facetiously, if you have any case before the Supreme Court, make sure that you put a free exercise of religion claim in there. <laughs> make sure. I don't care how you bootstrap it. Get it in there and you will win. It's that extreme. It really is. It's so uh, before, to, not, not to leave that because I want to, the historical, which you know so very well. So this big debate came out of um, uh, Catherine McKinnon, University of Michigan Law School. Um, Richard Delgado and his wife. Uh, uh, these are um, liberal first-rate scholars uh, over many years now, 20 and 30 years. And it was Professor McKinnon who first brought up and challenged the philosophers and the court and said, wait a minute. How come the Equal Protection Clause, equality of the, of the 14th Amendment, isn't as least equal to those primacy things you talk about in speech? And she was willing to say, yeah, we have a preference for speech, but hey, the 14th Amendment came more recently than the First Amendment, so maybe that ought to be given more heft here. And, uh, and, and um, Ronald Dworkin, Oxford and NYU Law School, came back and said, and that's not quite the right analysis. He said, the First Amendment speech is the best equalizing there is for everybody to get into the marketplace and debate it out. And then uh, uh, Richard Delgado and his wife came back and talked, which I think is a very important term, by the way, came back and talked about the lived experience of people today in our lives, a living constitution, not dead over here in 1787 and 1789. But the court's not buying it. They have said repeatedly, First Amendment principles stand above everything else. Even though the 14th Amendment, um, pretty clear. Thank you for your question. Dan, please. Maybe our last question, I think we're running a bit old. Dan Birak, folks, the benefactor and his wife, Carol. I, I attended uh, UVM. <laughs> I attended UVM 1951 to 1955. Nobody in this room is that old as me. <laughs> and Tom is just a, 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 a really representative of what the school was. We had a thing in the, the U.S. years called Cakewalk. You've probably mm -hmm. heard about it. And our fraternity was one of the biggest fraternities on campus. And Cakewalk was the major festival winter festival that everybody anticipated. If you were a guy, a girl would do anything to come date Cakewalk. But Cakewalk was conducted in blackface. And our fraternity advisor, a guy, a professor named Milt Madworney, he used to come to our fraternity meetings and say, this is the wrong thing to do, to do blackface. And Gradually, the fraternity agreed completely, and we were the first fraternity at Cakewalk Festival that didn't dress the people in blackface. And that thing spread across the country, and there was a, almost a revolt of the fact that the, the, they didn't have Cakewalk, and they didn't have this festival, and it's terrible. But it was the pioneering event, legally, that stopped blackface in this country. And uh, so it's a tribute <laughs> to meet Tom from years ago and know him as a president and knowing all this legal stuff, which I'm not a lawyer, uh, that made the university what it is today. Thank you, so that, I appreciate Can I mention your age? Sorry? Can I mention your age? <laughs> OK. Thank you, Dan. Um, a piece of UVM history that we have come a long way from. Um, 
this, this from um, a, a fabulous alum of the university, his wife Carol, and Dan is in his 91st year, so we're so happy, so happy that Carol and Dan could be here with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.